Hello, I'm Kevin Lin, Executive Director of the Institute for Sound Public Policy, and today is Sunday, August 25th, 2024. And it, things are really cooling down here weather-wise on the eastern seaboard. However, politically, it couldn't get any hotter. Uh, with the Republican and Democratic national conventions behind us, the tickets have been solidified. We have, on one hand, under the Democrats, Harris and Walls, and the other ticket being the Republican under President Trump and J.D. Vance. Now, the question I had in my mind as I was watching the Democratic National Convention last week was, which party, if elected, would be better for the working men and women of this country? And um, to get into this, I wanted to do a couple things. I think I'm going to show a bunch of clips I'll show, uh, share with you some of the things that I've been looking at on the internet and drawing from my past experience with both administrations um, and, you know, kind of let the chips lie where they will. So I want to start off with um, the speech that Biden made last, uh, last Monday at the Democratic National Co Convention. Specifically, this clip deals with his talking about his relationship with working men and women and labor. It's been my view since I came to the Senate. Okay. And that's why I'm proud to have been the first president to walk a picket line. And be labeled the most pro-union president in history, and I accept it. It's a fact. Because when unions do well, we all do well. You got it, man. You got it. All righty. So um, he said a few things in there that I think are worth noting and uh, opining on. Um, yes, I agree, absolutely. When unions do well, we all do well. Um, is he the most pro-labor union president ever? Uh, we're going to get into that. And he did walk a picket line, um, but the cynical part of me kind of says, eh, it was probably a photo op and little else. Um, but, you know, you have one of the things that happened during his administration that President Biden signed off on was the uh, CHIPS Act. And I'm going to go ahead and share my uh, screen, uh, screen with you and kind of talk about that. So the CHIPS and Science Act, um, it was signed into law by President Biden. It, it started back in 2020. It was bipartisan uh, in the Senate. Both Schumer and Young of Indiana were working on it. And it essentially uh, authorizes roughly $280 billion in new funding to boost domestic research and manufacturing of semiconductors in the United States, for which it appropriates $52.7 billion. Now, um, that's important because there was a time when we as a country dominated semiconductor manufacturing around the world. Uh, however, we've lost much of our industrial capacity there, basically farming it out to companies like TSCM in Taiwan. Uh, and then Intel also built fabrication plants all over the world. And uh, we find ourselves, um, you know, not really producing the chips that are driving the AI revolution. And that needs to change. So signing that act was a good thing. Now, if we go to the National Institute of Standards and Technology site, NIST, uh, we can get an update because right now about 30 billion of that 52 billion has been allotted. And we can scroll down and see the companies that those funds have been given to. And here we have Intel Corporation. Now, they got up to or are going to receive up to 8.5 billion. And this will be put into plants, fabrication plants in Chandler, Arizona, 
New Albany, Ohio, Hillsboro, Oregon, Rio Rancho, New Mexico. However, um, here's the fly in the ointment. <laughs> so re just recently, Intel announced that they're going to lay off 15,000 employees, which is about 15% of their staff. Now, they had a huge cut like this back in 2016, uh, where they laid off like uh, 17,000 employees, all domestic workers. And for the past several years, they've really been amping up on bringing on H-1B visa workers and uh, foreign students graduating with STEM degrees uh, and who are taking advantage of the optional practical training uh, employment authorization document. And uh, so I think what I would like to see a president do in an instance like this is be really aggressive when it comes to working with the executives of these companies and saying, hey, wait a minute, you're going to can 15,000 workers here in the United States? Well, pal, you're not going to get that $8.5 billion, and you may not get anything else. And by the way, if you want anything ever from us, we're going to make sure you don't use that money for things like stock buybacks and anything else that uh, CEO compensation might be uh, based on that doesn't increase uh, innovation and productivity here in the United States. Um, but that's just one of the uh, flies in the ointment there. Again, CHIPS, great act. However, we're seeing it's not already not working that great for American workers. Uh, also, I uh, want to talk about something else here. Um, I'm going to go back into Safari. Um, now, again, he uh, Biden dipped back into his time in the Senate. And I'm going to put on my glasses here because I think this is important for everyone to see and I want to highlight the right things. Uh, back in 1993, Senator Biden voted yes on H.R. 3450, which was the North American Free Trade Agreement. So here he is. He is a yay on that. And NAFTA was, as Ross Perot, Ross Perot at the time, he coined the term the giant sucking sound. And that's essentially what NAFTA was. It was a, it, they sucked manufacturing jobs from the U.S. down to Mexico. And actually the dirty little secret there was by the time that agreement was signed, many jobs were moving from Mexico to even lower rent countries like Indonesia and the Philippines. And then later that decade, uh, Congress and uh, President Clinton signed the World Trade Organization. Right away, within a few years, over 3.3 million manufacturing jobs left our shores and went to China. And again, Biden signed off on that. These were disastrous trade agreements. Um, so let's talk about some of the things that uh, Trump did during his time in office. Uh, what I'm going to do is, um, well, I'm going to start. I talked about aggressive action that a president should take. And these are the kind of things that if we're putting our faith in someone, we're giving them some facet of our moral autonomy, we want them to be, be aggressive when it comes to, for lack of a better term, taking care of us. And I want to play a clip from Michael Moore. Uh, and he had this to say about President Trump. And this was prior to the 2020 election. And he was reaching back to an incident that had happened a few years before. Donald Trump came to the Detroit Economic Club and stood there in front of the Ford Motor executives and said, if you close these factories as you're planning to do in Detroit and build them in Mexico, I'm going to put a 35% tariff on those cars when you send them back and nobody's going to buy them. It was an amazing thing to see. No politician, Republican or Democrat, had ever said anything like that to these executives. And it was music to the ears of people in Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Oh, He's saying the things to people who are hurting. 
And it's why every beaten down, nameless, forgotten working stiff who used to be part of what was called the middle class loves Trump. He is the human Molotov cocktail of that term that they've been waiting for. The human hand grenade that they can legally throw into the system that stole their lives from them. Although they lost their jobs, although they've been foreclosed on by the bank, next came the divorce and now the wife and kids are gone. The car's been repoed. They haven't had a real vacation in years. They're stuck with the shitty Obamacare bronze plan where you can't even get a fucking Percocet. They've essentially lost everything they had except one thing. The one thing that doesn't cost them a cent and is guaranteed to them by the American Constitution, the right to vote. They might be penniless, they might be homeless, they might be fucked over and fucked up, it doesn't matter because it's equalized on that day. A millionaire has the same number of votes as the person without a job, one. And there's more of the former middle class than there are in the millionaire class. The dispossessed will walk into the voting booth, be handed a ballot, close the curtain, and take that lever, or felt pen or touch screen, and put a big fucking X in the box by the name of the man who has threatened to upend and overturn the very system that has ruined their lives. Donald J. Trump. They see that the elite who ruined their lives hate Trump. Corporate America hates Trump. Wall Street hates Trump. The career politicians hate Trump. The media hates Trump. Trump's election is going to be the biggest fuck you ever recorded in human history. And again, that was the um, prior election, of course, but, um, you know, you can see uh, just there. He was discussing or uh, speaking anecdotally about, you know, what uh, President Trump actually did, you know, threatening uh, the executives at Ford Motor Company. If you shutter these plants and move those jobs to Mexico, well, guess what? You're getting a 35 percent tariff on your product. And that stopped it. And that wasn't the only time Trump got medieval uh, with um, executives. And uh, I'm going to play another clip. And this one, <laughs> I can actually say I was in the room at the time. Uh, so here we go. Recently, the CEO of the Tennessee Valley Authority, Jeffrey Lyash, made a disastrous and heartless decision. The TVA announced that it would lay off over 200 American workers and replace them with cheaper foreign workers brought in from overseas. The Tennessee Valley Authority leadership then ordered the American workers to train their foreign replacements, rubbing salt in their very open wounds. So we're going to bring in workers. They're going to be foreign workers. And People from Tennessee and some other states right around it uh, are going to train them what to do and how to do it. It doesn't work that way. As we speak, we're finalizing H-1B regulations so that no American worker is replaced ever again. H-1Bs should be used for top, highly paid talent to create American jobs, not as inexpensive labor program to destroy American jobs. Sitting at the table are six of the TVA workers who were ordered to train the foreign labor flown in to replace them. I want you and your colleagues to know that my administration will not be putting up with, I happen to know, a young woman who has been uh, very active over the last couple of years because we were together on Disney and a couple of other things. And it all seems to be working out pretty well. Thank You're doing you. a great job. And I thank you for it. But that's why I'm formally removing the chairman of the board, James Thompson, and board member Richard Howa. If the TVA does not move swiftly to reverse their decision to rehire their workers, then more board members will be removed. We have the absolute right to remove board members and the board. All right. So there you are. President Trump, literally that day, he fired the chairman of the, the board of the Tennessee Valley Authority, and he fired 
uh, one of the directors. And while we were sitting there and, you know, we were going around the room hearing from all the workers, um, Mark Meadows came in with a note. He had just gotten off the phone with the CEO of the Tennessee Valley Authority, Jeff Lyash. And you can, uh, on the, that note, that is the note that Mark Meadows handed President Trump, basically saying the CEO of TVA had rescinded his decision to outsource those IT jobs. And I got to say something, ladies and gentlemen. To this day, those almost 200 jobs are still there being worked by American union workers. And also, I was told that they weren't going to stop at IT. They were going to go into accounting and all these other departments. <clears throat> so all the other white collar professionals, you might think, well, you're salaried, you have benefits, uh, you know, you're, you're beyond being touched or impacted by you know, bad immigration and employment, bad immigration employment visa policies. Uh, no, you're not. Now, the thing that's irksome about that, and this kind of gets into this whole dynamic between union leadership and the rank and file union members. So that union that was represented the, representing those Tennessee Valley Authority workers, and it's the IFPTE, that's the International Federation of Professional Technical Engineers, again, the IFPTE. In 2020 and 2024, they endorsed Biden and Harris, and in 2024, they're endorsing Waltz and uh, Harris. I mean, this to me is absolutely amazing. I'm going to go ahead and pull up their website here because I want to share this with everyone. So you'll know that I'm not, um, I didn't like uh, dream this one up. This is actually what they're doing. Now, I'm going to put on my glasses here because I do want to read some of this here. Um, now, this is, <laughs> here they go. Quote. Harris has a strong record of support for working families. Well, okay, but relative to what? Relative to someone who saved 200 jobs, went out of his way, got very aggressive with management, and those families, do you think they're better off or worse off for uh, a Trump presidency? But this is, again, there's such a disconnect in many unions between the leadership and the rank and file. So this is what Br uh, Briggs had to say. <clears throat> um, it's imperative that Vice President Harris continue to move forward with this agenda that has already benefited millions upon millions of workers. IFPTE is honored to give her our full support. And he's talking about uh, pro-worker and pro-union recommendations included in the White House Worker Organizing and Employment Task Report. Really? And uh, this is from Gay Henson, who was the president of the local uh, for the TVA, has since moved up in the world. Um, IFPTE is proud to endorse President Biden and Vice President Harris for a second term. So this is back before they uh, went to, uh, they did the switcheroo between uh, Harris and Biden. So I got to tell you something, folks. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, am I right to be angry? You know, the, the fact is they threw me under the bus about two weeks after uh, our, that day in the White House on August 3rd, 2020, because it was our organization that spent the money that create, and created the ad that President Trump saw that got him engaged in protecting those jobs. That union, that union, that specific union, the IFPTE, had already waved the flag of surrender to the globalists. They were already allowing their workers to 
say that to uh, already allowing their workers to begin training their H-1B visa replacements. And they were saying, well, we're quasi-federal employees. We can't strike. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, there's a point to say, you know, what good is a union when you're doing that? But fortunately, uh, President Trump got involved, and those jobs are there today. So um, I'd also like to um, talk about another thing, that very specific thing that President Trump did. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. I'm going to pull that up. There we go. I got it. And clicking around. Here we go. All right. So um, President, on that day, on August 3rd, 2020, when we were all in the White House, he saw, President Trump signed an executive order. And it called for aligning federal contracting and hiring practices. And what this was about was all federal agencies would have to do a top to bottom review of every contract to see if there were H-1B visa dependent consulting firms working in the government. And within a period of time to move them out uh, because again, you know, uh, this was all part of, you know, uh, America first, uh, putting America workers first, which none of these companies do. And in addition to uh, this executive order, uh, President Trump, he had mentioned it briefly in that clip. But what he had done was three rule changes that would have defanged the H-1B visa program and protected it from impacting, negatively impacting normal IT, IT sector workers here in the U.S. Unfortunately, uh, he didn't have a second term and none of those rules got implemented. So um, those, are my th that, that's, um, those are my thoughts there. Uh, also, another uh, hit kind of against Biden too. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Let me pull up one other thing. And... This comes from the 101st Congress. So, uh, in 1990, uh, then Senator Biden voted yes on S-358. It's called here the Immigration Act of 1989, Naturalization Amendments of 1989, but it's known to us today as the Immigration Reform Act of 1990 that was ultimately signed by President H.W. Bush. And Biden was a signature. Well, he was a yay vote on that. And um, what this act did was it created the H-1B visa program, ladies and gentlemen. And I had mistakenly thought for a long time that the H-1B visa program was simply being abused by corporations to displace Americans. What I've come to realize and what is actual, what is the facts of the matter is the H-1B visa program is being used to, it was, it's being used exactly how it was designed to work, which is displace American workers. And there's a whole bunch of things we can get into there, but we won't. And um, that really kind of brings me to the, the end of the specific things that I wanted to bring up that are kind of helping me evaluate which of the tickets uh, Harris Waltz, Trump, Vance, that would be better for U.S. workers. And when I started off uh, chatting with you tonight, I had mentioned that traditionally the Democratic Party has been the party of the working man and woman, uh, the party that was supporting and being supported by union men and women in the country. However, things are really changing, and they're changing fast and they're changing in a big way. And I'm going to share a few clips with you of, of what I would call luminaries in the national conservatism movement, which is fast taking over the Republican Party. And what you're going to hear and see in these clips are people that are doing concrete work to make the Republican Party 
the party of the working men and women. So without any further ado, I'm going to start off with, uh, we'll start off with Oren Cass. And Oren is the executive director of a group called American Compass, a really amazing think tank and recommend everyone uh, pay it a visit. So here are three themes I think we should focus on. First, worker power is good. It is inherently moral and it is vital to a prosperous economy. On Monday evening, Senator Hawley spoke about embracing private sector unions. Now, I have my concerns with how those unions are run, often as progressive activist groups rather than genuine representatives of their workers. But the good news is the overwhelming majority of workers feel the same way. They want representation that focuses on the workplace with no connection to national politics, which makes an extraordinary opportunity for conservatives. <clears throat> because the idea of worker power and a strong labor movement is something that conservatives should love. We should want labor to be able to meet capital on a level playing field so that workers share fully in the prosperity they create instead of using taxing and redistribution to address a fundamentally unequal and unfair economy. Wow, uh, that was awesome. And the next person that I want you to hear from is uh, Batia Unger Sargon. <clears throat> and um, Batia is one of the senior editors at Newsweek. And she's recently written a book uh, that uh, really spotlights American workers whose backs are against the wall. She traveled across the country, uh, interviewed dozens and dozens of people. And I mean, the insights that she picked up, I think, are really helpful. And they're actually helping turn the Republican Party and making it more open to the needs of workers and not necessarily the needs uh, predominantly of capital. But Many hardworking Americans are struggling. These are our neighbors and they work much, much harder than we do. And yet they cannot achieve the most modest version of the American dream due to an economy designed by experts to plunder the middle class. America has broken its contract with the working class, on the right with trickle-down economics, and on the left with the woke ideology. And, you know, there are ideas on the left that seem to us like they were designed, you know, as an affront on traditional values. But oftentimes these views are actually an alibi for the dispossession of the working class. And I'll just give one example quickly, and we, I could talk about this more in the... Okay, and that was Batya. And the uh, next reel that I'm going to run is Riley Moore, who's currently the treasurer of West Virginia. He just won his primary uh, for Congress, so he will be uh, joining Congress uh, next January. So here is Riley Moore. Uh, I just want to highlight this. I, I am proud to be endorsed by the affiliated construction trades, the insulators, the boiler makers, the carpenters, cement masons, IBEW, iron workers, laborers, operating engineers, painters, plumbers and pipe fitters, sheet metal workers, the UMWA, which is the United Mine Workers of America, United Steel Workers, and the Teamsters. All of these organizations came behind me in my Republican primary as a conservative and endorsed me in this election, which. Okay, and the next person we're gonna hear from is Rachel Bovard, and she's a, a senior executive at the Conservative Partnership Institute. And boy, I'll tell you, if anyone delivered a speech that really spoke to the, the sea change that is going on within the Republican Party, it has to be uh, this speech by Rachel. And here's a clip from it. Fight we're in for what it is. Our movement is America's slow kindled corrective to the Washington Republican establishment's willful neglect. We are America's answer to the hollow men who betrayed our workers into corporate exploitation, our taxpayers into unsustainable debt, our sons and brothers into unwinnable wars, 
and our citizens into unconstitutional servitude. We are and must be conservatives of action. And this is what sets national conservatism <clears throat> apart. We don't live in a fantasy world of what ought to be. We live and will fight to fix in the wreckage of what is. Wow. I mean, and I'm going to play one more speech, and this is by um, Sean O'Brien of the, uh, he's the head of the Teamsters. And, uh, you know, he, this is a clip of his speech at the Republican National Convention. He was invited by uh, President Trump to speak there. So here we go. This is a clip from Sean O'Brien. Several months ago, I asked the RNC and the DNC for the opportunity to speak. To be frank, when President Trump invited me to speak at this convention, there was political unrest on the left and on the right. Hard to believe. Anti-union groups demanded the president rescind his invitation. The left called me a traitor. Well, <laughs> there you go. And that was one heck of a speech. Uh, I really invite everyone to watch the whole thing. And the fact that the head of a, a large union like the Teamsters was brought in to speak at the Republican National Convention, again, just speaks to the sea change that's going on. So um, we're getting really close to my, the, the time I wanted to spend here with you tonight. Uh, I, before I go, though, I 